So I hope you have had a good uh, lunch break. And this morning we have heard two really fantastic talks by Steve. Uh, Yes. On this one. Is it good? Try, try now, please. One, two, three. No. Maybe well, you have to take it this closer or to chew it. Chew it. Um, try now. Hello, everybody. No. I, I think you're not. It works. Okay, it works. C can you hear? Can you hear? So, so c can you turn on the volume? Try. Ah. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Okay, now it's the right issue. So, this morning we have heard these fantastic talks of Steve, and you can ask what I can possibly enter, uh, add to these nice talks about machine learning. And on so, attempt number 10. <laughs> so the question is, what, what can, I, can I possibly add to these beautiful uh, talks? And <laughs> number 11, can you hear me? OK. <laughs> Well, I, I, I will focus, I will, I will try to present um, a spectrum from reduced order modeling starting from first principle, Navier-Stokes based, to purely data driven. And there are a number of more things we can learn. And as mentioned already in my first talk, I would not be here without the phenomenal support of smart students and equally smart uh, um, colleagues. The, a uh, package which I'm going to present for the reduced order modeling has been developed together with uh, Daniel Fernet and Richard Amseman. Uh, Guy is a mastermind um, of machine learning control and, and, and uh, Nang uh, um, is a pioneer in deep mean field modeling. Um, uh, Arthur Elot did the locally linear embedding and this uh, Luc Pasteur, Francois Lusserang, Navid Nayere, Marek Mozinski, Steve Branton and Ulrika Kaiser, they um, are my um, senior colleagues who have opened me the eyes to many different um, um, directions and um, we did very nice joint uh, work. First, um, I will motivate why we need reduced um, order modeling. We have seen already a couple of um, examples. And uh, then I will acquaint you with a method, proximity map. Who knows proximity maps of you? Okay, a few. So I, after this talk, it will be many more. And I think every, before doing anything else with your data, you should do proximity map because they really tell you a lot about um, your, your, your data. Uh, um, if you have outliers or, no, or not, you, you, um, can color and use them in many different directions. And then I will plunge more deeply in um, Gaiokin modeling, Navier-Stokes based uh, Gaiokin model, modeling and present our um, programming package. Then I will give you a couple of examples of PUD models, more examples and some critical enablers. Then I will um, continue what uh, um, Steve has um, discussed this this morning, uh, um, manifold models, two ways of arriving at these uh, manifold models. And then I will end with a with cluster-based model, which is a purely data-driven model. So you do not need to know anything about the Navier-Stokes equation. This is something which you can fully um, um, automate. So this is, gives you an, a, a spectrum of uh, reduced order models for different um, um, purposes. So why could we be interested in reduced order models? To some extent, this question has been answered by the previous speakers. I will add uh, one perspective. So you could say that the 
reduced order model is kind of the glue between um, your theory where you have equations which are very li uh, which have limited uh, um, validity to your um, um, data and um, so the, in, in the theory you have understood um, a, a lot uh, but you have um, a very low accuracy and if you look at your flow data you, you can be very accurate but you understand very little and so these reduced order models kind of uh, uh, lifts your understanding by focusing on the gist. You can also take a, pot um, a computational view um, so these may be the coherent sizes of the coherent structures which you want to resolve. So these are the finest structures, maybe the Kolmogorov vortices. These are the large scale structures. If you want to resolve all of them, uh, um, Navier-Stokes based, then you have to do a direct numerical simulation. And we know that this is extremely co uh, costly. And even when uh, I'm walking here up and down, I create a von Kármán vortex shedding. It will be next to impossible to, 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 to solve this uh, uh, um, um, numerically. Um, so one simplification is you remove the small scale structures and replace it with a model. Uh, the Smagorinsky uh, uh, model, and you assume that this transition is universal enough so that, that you can deal with one closure model. And you can go a step further and you can say, okay, I will take the unsteady runs equation. Your dynamic resolutions is now limited to something like um, an oscillatory flow. So it's very, very limited. And um, the reduced order models are somewhere in between. They resolve less than large eddy simulations, but they resolve significantly more than unsteady runs. Of course, you pay for this accuracy uh, a price, and the price is that these are more configuration specific. And this is the range where you also want to do uh, um, control design and um, optimization. At the moment, you do a run simulation. Essentially, you, you, you believe the coherent structures are not interesting to you. You only want to know the um, mean flow here. So this is a computational perspective. Then there's another perspective, understanding. If you uh, um, read Prandtl's paper, uh, the, the, the fluid dynamicists at that time were very inspired by the, by the Orr-Sommerfeld um, equation. And there was a hope that by understanding the instabilities of the flow, you can also learn something about the coherent structures and you can also learn something about uh, turbulence. And one of these passes have been mentioned by Steve uh, um, um, this morning. One pass is the following. Of course, you know that the flow, uh, um, the dynamics of the flow changes with the Reynolds number. If the Reynolds number is small enough, you have a steady flow. So you have a fixed point. At some point, uh, at, at some critical Reynolds number, it becomes uh, um, um, oscillatory. We have seen the cylinder wake already. Then this uh, um, instability is called um, Hopf bifurcation. And one scenario which has been hypothesized by Landau and Hopf, uh, 41 and 48, is that you, you find more and more of, the, of these Hopf bifurcations, in fact, infinitely many as you increase the Reynolds number, and turbulence can be understood as a sequence of infinitely many Hopf bifurcations, creating more and more um, um, frequency. So this looks very appealing, but this picture is uh, wrong, uh, um, because at some point, uh, um, you, you have something like a cascade. So you have an activation of many frequencies. So at the moment, for instance, you have a vortex and you have a vortex uh, a filament deformation. You create turbulence. And this is not a bifurcation anymore. So nice scenario. Good to have these smart people on board. But uh, uh, this was uh, uh, not, not a good theory. Then there were some theories in the 80s uh, from, um, from chaos theory. So the question is, how can a limit cycle become unstable? stable, um, apart from um, exhibiting another Hopf bifurcation, you can have a period double uh, per Feigenbaum scenario or a period doubling scenario. These have been observed in a very narrow uh, data range. And uh, you end up with some chaotic flow, which might be described uh, in, in similar spirit like uh, the, the, the Lorentz equation, from which we have learned um, this morning. You can also have an intermittency scenario where essentially uh, you, you, you create uh, um, a larger and larger um, um, spikes. 
And this leads to the strange attractor, and you have also passes uh, from the uh, two torus and the three torus, that means from two oscillations and um, three oscillations. The problem with this, I would claim the strange trunk attractor has never been found in fluid mechanics. If you look at the correlation dimension, the people have always measured the length of their data. And fluid mechanics is the following. You have an orchestra with almost infinitely many play players. And when there are some uh, um, um, leading violinists and everybody tunes in, and it's impossible to get them somewhat synchronized. So, so everybody adds stochastically now the flow. And if you look at the data, essentially you see it be, it, it, it's much closer to uh, uh, a, a deterministic stochastic system than to a, a, a strange attractor. So these are dreams with a termination date, so it was at the end of the uh, um, um, 80s. Um, but they have still uh, inspired some approaches which turned out to be right. Now we go a bit engineering and we want to do uh, um, turbulence control. So with turbulence control, we need some actuators and some sensors. And the question is, of course, where do we place these actuators and sensors? What type of actuators should we uh, um, um, use? Which, uh, uh, where do we place them? Which amplitude range uh, should they um, have with frequency range? And so on. And you can ask the same thing for the sensing. For the sensing, it's easy. But if, you, if, you, uh, if the actuation is wrong, um, um, you have lost. And now uh, we do not have time for myriads of high fidelity simulations. So one approach is typically you make, say, few well-chosen large eddy simulation or you use a plant you truly believe in. And from there on, you try to distill some reduced order model. And the reduced order model allows you to explore uh, a new, better uh, a minima. And of course, at some point, you have to test them. So essentially, the Reduced order models uh, um, um, has, has less accuracy, but a broader range of uh, um, um, operating conditions or control laws. And actually, this approach occasionally uh, works. Now, the next question is, how should we characterize coherent structure? And Xavier did a wonderful talk on the, on the first day. Uh, um, I will remind you how the um, vortex shedding behind the cylinder wake has been viewed. So here you look uh, at a smoke visualization around a cylinder. And if you would not know anything about a Gajorkin model, you would say, oh, there are vortices. There's a vortex here, which goes like that, another vortex here, and so on. So the, so the vortexes move downstream. By the way, it's called von Kármán Vortex Street because von Kármán has built the vortex model describing this um, um, shedding. So here you adopt a Lagrangian view. You say these coherent structures uh, localized uh, um, are important. You look at the vorticity and you characterize the vortices with maybe a Rankine vortex uh, and, and, and some um, circulation. And the dynamics is described by Bio Savar. So this is our um, vortex, uh, is, is, is a vortex model. So these vortex models are the, are the models of the first hour and, and, and hundreds of them have been constructed. They are very robust. We even use them in industry because of their robustness. But there are some disadvantages. The disadvantage is typically they are limited to two dimensions. For three dimensions, they essentially become um, um, CFD. Another approach is uh, you look, for instance, at the V component here on this um, X axis. So these two vortices, essentially, they create a downwash. This one creates an upwash. This one creates a downwash. So it does not create much fantasy to see that, oh, there's a traveling wave. It goes like that, 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 that. If you have a traveling wave, say cosine x minus t, you know you can write it as cosine x times uh, um, um, cosine t uh, minus sine x times sine t. Uh, so you have your space-dependent modes and your time-dependent uh, mode amplitudes. And of course, you can generalize this uh, concept by saying, OK, you have a modal expansions. We have seen this um, or, um, already. So this would be the Gajokin approximation of the flow. And then you have to find a way how to derive a dynamical system uh, um, um, for these mode amplitudes. But the Navier-Stokes equation can help you in this respect. And of course, there are many other ways of characterizing coherent structures. Uh, we have seen the Lagrangian coherent structures. They don't lead to a dynamical model. There are also other dynamical models, but I do not want to give a complete review about uh, this. Anybody knows another reduced order model than Gajokin and Vortex model? Well, we have heard already one. Parabolized stability equations. 
<laughs> so here are some milestones of uh, low dimensional modeling or reduced order modeling. You can ar argue that it might, may have started with Leonardo da Vinci. He has pictured uh, the vortices very nicely and with most of his work, so 50% of the pictures were right and 50% of the uh, uh, pictures were, were, were wrong. Uh, um, Helmholtz has laid the foundation um, of vortex methods with his uh, famous Helmholtz vortex laws. Gajokin has pioneered uh, um, Gajokin methods, not in fluid mechanics, but for uh, uh, membranes. And then Lorentz essentially made us aware of uh, that there could exist, that chaotic motion is something which we consider uh, um, as generic. So that means if we have two states which are close, we should expect them to exponentially uh, um, um, diverge. As you can see, the photos have become increasingly better um, over the last 500 years. Now we go to a, a tool which, uh, I, uh, which we are using essentially in, in, in every application, proximity map. And the main idea is very simple. Uh, so you have, say, you, you have your snapshot data. Maybe you have 10,000 snapshots, uh, uh, 1 billion grid points uh, each, and you would like to see how much um, uh, um, um, sense they make and how close they um, are. So what you are doing is you, t you consider here your original snapshots in a high-dimensional state space, and they uh, um, have a certain distance from each other. So it could be done measured with a Hilbert space norm or whatever. So they have a distance from each other. And you would like to project it in, let's say, a two-dimensional plane such that the distances um, are preserved. If you have uh, um, only three snapshots, it can be done. Uh, it's very um, easy. If you have more, of course, uh, you can only do this uh, job um, approximately. These coordinates are called uh, um, feature point. And... Uh, they, they typically give a very good guidance on the proximity uh, of your um, um, data, but they can, of course, also fool you. So here is the mathematics behind it. So the optimization is the following. You say, you, you say okay, try to find a mapping from the high-dimensional space to the low-dimensional space such that uh, um, the um, um, error which you make average error on the distances is minimized. So these are the snapshots in the high dimensional space. These are the feature vectors in the low dimensional space. Uh, um, this is the distance between the M snapshot and the M snapshot. This is the same for the features uh, um, vectors. What you want, you want these two differences to be small. And in fact, you want the cumulative uh, um, error to be minimized. So find a T that E is minimal. And this problem can be solved. Um, it turns out, if you, if you don't add further constraints, then gamma 1 and gamma 2 are the first two PUD modes, but typically you would add more constraints, and, and, and then you would link your feature space also to your performance and other things. So what did I do? Well, the executive summary for professors is look in Wikipedia, and for students, apply a CMD scale uh, in, in, in MATLAB. There are um, several degrees of freedom. So one degree of freedom is you have to, you, you can move the point in the feature space. What do you do? You center them uh, so that the average is zero. Um, you can, yes, also rotational degree of freedom. You can rotate the feature space as you want. So essentially you make sure, like in PUD, that the largest fluctuation happens in gamma one and then gamma two and so on. And you have to live with mirror symmetry, so you can uh, uh, um, reflect uh, um, the, the, the triangle or the configuration around some, some axis. Uh, so gamma 1 could be positive or negative. There's no way how to fix that. Again, like with uh, um, PUD. Now I'll show you one example. And wake behind an Ahmed body. You see this is where you see UX. You see a, a lot of fine scale structure, what you don't see, there are also large scale structures. And here you have the um, feature coordinates, so each dot corresponds to one point of the simulation. Now we want to interpret this a bit. So what I did, 
Or what we did in addition, we, we, we clustered uh, um, um, the data and we looked for every cluster. Uh, we looked um, at the uh, um, um, a drag, so this is the drag, this is the lift, and this is the side force. And when you look a bit closer, you see here on the left, uh, the lift is negative, the side force is negative, and here the side force um, is positive, and here it's nearly neutral. Essentially, what we see here in gamma 1 is kind of the bistability of the flow. And um, the uh, um, alpha 2 is related to some uh, base flow um, variation of the flow. So we, this gives you one example of the uh, proximity map and we see, will see others in the future, you, you, in, in, in this talk. You can um, also apply it to functions, to, to many other things. We apply it to controllers as we have seen in my first uh, talk. So now we go to the first real reduced order model, the PUD Gayokin um, method. And it started with Boris Gayokin. He was born 1871 in, 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 in some small town. He was uh, um, in a, born, in, um, his, his, his family was poor. And uh, um, so he initially struggled by being the writer in the court. And then at some point, but his interest was always engineering and mathematics. At some point, he made his way uh, to the technical um, university and um, was also um, an engineer at the Kharkov locomotive industry. So in 2006, he was part in an anti zar demonstration where a policeman got killed. And the Tsar was much nicer than Stalin, so he has put him in a prison uh, where he could work. So he says this was the most productive one and a half years uh, uh, um, he had, where he got all the ideas for his future. So uh, this is, could be considered as a Russian sabbatical. And then he had problems getting a job. <laughs> but uh, at the end, he entered as a Polytechnical uh, Institute. Uh, um, eight years later, um, he has published his book about the, his, his work about the Gayokin method. He became uh, head of the faculty. He became corresponding member of the academic society. He became part of the academic society. So one of the 48 academicians uh, uh, um, top ranked in the US. And he, at some point, he has died a natural death. Uh, enjoying uh, um, a, a, a lot of fame um, afterwards. So these uh, methods have been used everywhere, so they are, are the basis of any CFD uh, method. Uh, and uh, um, Lawrence was the first who uh, suggested proper orthogonal decomposition um, in some report. Lumley has coined the work. It took them something like 20 years to get the first model uh, the first dynamic model of the fluid flow. What was interesting about this, this model was much more complex than any of the following model in the next couple of years. And when I taught reduced order modeling, I had to read this paper every time, again, 50 pages condensed with a lot of valuable information. And you see there were few people who are really ahead of the time and have anticipated a lot of problems and have partially solved them in this uh, model. And then there were a couple of uh, activities uh, um, using this for flow control. And here, um, an example of a, a um, Gayokin method. So we want to solve this um, equation. You know what it is, convection equation. Flow goes from left to right. And um, you have a boundary condition. So we, let's say it's periodic from 0 to 2 pi. We have an initial condition, let's say it's cosine x, and of course you do not know how this equation evolves, right? And now we make an ansatz, we say, okay, let's say maybe we can represent it with uh, the first uh, two Fourier modes and some mode amplitudes, but now we have a problem. So we have parametrized our solution in terms of two parameter, but we have a PDE. So the best we can hope for is that we can minimize an error uh, um, but not that we can actually solve the PDE. So what are we doing? So one method to do this is uh, um, using the inner, inner product, so projecting the residual of this equation on the two modes. So we need two equations for two unknowns, which are the mode amplitudes, and we take the underlying equation, so we project it here on U1, and you can see what happens. Uh, 
Uh, so first we see the residuals and we put in the solution in the residual and at the end we get a1 dot equals minus a2 and we do the same with u2. We get a2 dot equals a1. So this is our Gajorkin system. Our initial condition with cosine x is a1 equals 1 or something like that. And this has a solution. The solution is a1 cosine t, a2 equals sine t. If you put these things together with cosine x minus t, so we are lucky, we get the exact solution. Uh, of this uh, convection equation. So this is um, so th this is the spirit of the um, um, Gajorkian model, and uh, we can embed it in a space portrait. Uh, here we try to uh, envision everything in terms of a1 and a2. The POD mode amplitudes. When we are on this point, we have the cosine. When we are on this point, we have the sine minus cosine, uh, a minus sine. So we are moving around. So, so as a tr wave uh, travels from left to right, we are moving on a circle, and at some point we go to the initial part. Of course, when we go to the Navier-Stokes equation, we have a bit more work to do. Uh, we have to find an approximation here, and we have learned already one approach, POD. And we have to find uh, a, um, a system, a Gajorkin system for the Navier-Stokes equation, and this is what I'm going to derive. Uh, um, now it's very simple. Uh, what you have to keep in mind, now our inner product is essentially uh, the two velocity fields with an Euclidean inner, inner product integrated over the domain. So standard inner, inner product of um, L2. So, um, first, we will... Um, uh, uh, f f first, we compute the POD modes, and we take the average of the, uh, uh, um, we take, take a basic mode as a, uh, as a mean flow. Does anybody of you have an idea why we do this? Well, it will become obvious in the next step. Um, so now I, Scott has asked, uh, um, what is the request for the data? What we are doing, we are doing a second uh, um, um, order statistical order analysis of our flow data. So at minimum, the first moments must be right and the second moment must be right. And just as a reminder, if you have the cross correlation between U prime, the fluctuation at X and Y, this can be expanded like this. So this, this is a simple representation in the uh, um, in PUD modes. So the next step, what we are doing, we are building the correlation matrix. So here you see uh, we take this m snapshot, we subtract the mean and the n snapshot and we subtract the mean and we divide by, by m. So this is our correlation matrix, just, just a, a volume integral, not, not very difficult. And I want to emphasize we are subtracting here u0. And I see, I see a lot of publications where this has not been done. The price which you pay uh, if you do not look at the fluctuation, but if you take the whole velocity field, is large. So number one, your first POD mode is likely to be something like a mean flow. Number two, the fluctuation now has to be orthogonal to the mean flow. Uh, uh, this is not what you typically have uh, in a second. And uh, the convergence of the POD mode is not guaranteed. The lambda i cannot be interpreted as variances anymore. Uh, the POD approximation does not fulfill the boundary condition for any a, um, AI. So uh, and now you, you, you have to make an extra constraint on the mode amplitudes. The POD model is not physical. For instance, if you, if you do the Gajorkin projection, then you suddenly have a varying oncoming velocity in your dynamical system. So this is a real screw up and misuse of the approach. So, uh, all the beauty of the POD modeling is lost if you do not subtract u0 uh, in, in your expansion and in the um, fluctuation. So the next step, what you are doing is very easy. Uh, you solve the Fredholm equation. So essentially, you look at the, um, you do a spectral analysis of your correlation matrix. You get a couple of vectors. Uh, this C uh, is uh, positive semi-definite, semi so the eigenvalues have to be all uh, um, um, larger or equal um, to zero. The modes um, have to be orthogonal. And uh, so you have a, a, a real non-negative um, um, spectrum. You had a question? Uh, yeah, my question is uh, uh, about the mean subtraction if you have a stationary flows, of course, but uh, if your flow is not stationary and so your mean is not converged. 
What is your uh, point of view about that? Uh, good, good, good point. The question, there, there's another reason why you should uh, remove it. And the assumption which I make was that we have stationary boundary conditions. For instance, you have a cylinder wake, you have the no slip condition on the cylinder, and you have uniform flow at infinity or far away. So the mean flow now takes away the, the um, uniform flow condition. And, and, and the remainder, U prime, so satisfies the, the, the homogeneous Dirichli um, condition. And if U prime satisfies the homogeneous uh, um, Dirichli condition, that means all uh, the fluctuation must fill it, fulfill it. That means uh, the POD mode must fulfill it. And now you can, in the expansion, you can choose the POD mode am amplitudes arbitrary. And that, that's what you want. You want, you, you want a Gajorkin system without constraints. So this is, this is what you have to do to arrive at this uh, point. Good. So now you have the eigen modes. And essentially what the PUD mode is, the PUD mode is nothing but a linear combination of your snapshots done in a smart way. And uh, of course, the more, more snapshots you have, you have to re rescale it somehow. And you remove some of the fluctuation intensity uh, um, in, in, the, in, in the direction. So at, that, at the end, you have also normal uh, modes. And you can check this um, um, also by looking at the, at the trace. Uh, uh, so that the, uh, the sum of the trace of the correlation matrix should be the sum of the eigenvalues, should be the, the average fluctuation energy in, in, in the flow. So these are the POD modes. Uh, and now you have the uh, um, AIs. And, 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 and these are the, uh, um, the, the amplitudes, again, are, are somewhat proportional to the, to, to, to the modes. So we have again a couple of prop, um, properties. So the POD modes can be um, obtained by projecting the fluctuation on UI. Um, the average should be zero, and the second moment should be uh, um, centered. So you have not only also normal, normality in space, you have also um, orthogonality uh, in, in the frequency, uh, sorry, yeah, in, 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 the, in the POD mode um, domain. Good. Now we go uh, uh, one step uh, um, um, further. So what can we do uh, uh, having this um, um, fluctuation? Uh, we can get a lot of inspiration when we look at munin Yaglom, And uh, so all the equations which you see there where you, where you have the flow decomposed in a mean flow in a fluctuation uh, can be written much more accurately in terms of a POD mode. Uh, um, and basis. So we start with now with the Reynolds decomposition. I will remind you of an equation which you should know from the um, uh, um, from fluid mechanics. The Navier-Stokes equation is written like this. The Reynolds equation is essentially um, 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 the residual with the Reynolds decomposition equals to zero. A weak formulation means you take the residual and multi can, you can multiply it with any test function and you should, should get zero. Why is this uh, um, effort? Well, you can include, for instance, now shocks in um, your um, solutions. And um, if you multiply the residual with U prime, then you get an interesting equation. You get the equation of um, fluctuation energy. And here you see uh, um, the Navier-Stokes equation. You, um, uh, it can be expanded with a Reynolds decomposition. Now it looks something like that. So it always has some constant and linear quadratic terms here, a constant and linear terms here. If you average them, these are the survivors here. So this is a Reynolds equation. If you now subtract uh, the Reynolds equation uh, from the Navier-Stokes equation, you get an equation for the fluctuation energy. If you multiply uh, um, this now with U prime, you get these um, volume integrals. So this essentially is your production term. So this leads to the production term. This leads to the convection term. This leads to the transfer term. This leads to the um, um, dissipation. And this leads to the pressure power. So just a reminder of your Navier-Stokes. Uh, um, a fluid mechanics uh, lecture. Now we can do the same thing uh, uh, with, with the modes. Here's a picture, the fluctuation. 
There's some uh, one term called production. So this essentially determines how much energy the fluctuation gets from the mean flow. There's one term called dissipation. This is how much energy the heat reservoir or the molecular structures uh, uh, get from the um, coherent structure. And there are two terms which are determined by the boundary. One is the pressure power and one is the convection. So in an infinite domain, uh, a periodic pipe and so on, these terms would vanish. And now you can do the same thing also with, um, you can do the same thing uh, um, um, mode-wise, but what you have to do now, you have to expand U prime in terms of um, the Gaiokin expansion. Instead of uh, um, projecting this residual on U prime for the global energy balance, you, you project it on AI UI. And what you see immediately from the structure, if I'm adding up all these contributions here, then uh, um, this becomes U prime. And essentially, this gives a, a basis why we inter interpret this as a modal energy flow balance. There's another equation which is uh, um, vital. If you project it in, on UI, we again get the Gaiokin system. And as seen, uh, um, in my last lecture, the Gaiokin system um, has some, some linear term, it has some uh, um, quadratic term, and it also has some um, pressure-related uh, uh, term. Just, you can make many, many more variations uh, with this. For instance, you can, in principle, project the residual on EX, the unit vector in X direction, and this gives you the equation for the drag. So now you are capable of explaining the drag uh, um, in terms of your Gaiokin expansion, or you can uh, um, multiply it with EY, then you can interpret the, the, the lift. You can look at the Reynolds stress term and so on. So there's a lot of uh, um, equations which you can derive just with this simple ansatz. Here, I want to focus just on the uh, modal energy analysis. We do again the analysis here and here. Uh, the Gaiokin system looks uh, um, 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 like that. And if we multiply with AIUI, we get these terms using all the PUD uh, um, um, properties. So there's one term left over, this one here, which leads to the production. There's another term from the Gaiokin system times the energy leading to the um, convection term. There's a irreducible term, essentially this is the essence of turbulence, which leads to the transfer term and dissipative term and uh, some other terms. You see that uh, the modal production, convection and dissipation scale um, are proportional to the fluctuation energy in each of the modes and the Gaiokin system essentially determines something um, like the gain and these nonlinear terms are the ones which are the uh, uh, troublemaker. The picture which now emerges is the following. So you have the, the different modes here. There are some terms, essentially they get some uh, um, energy from the mean flow, lose it to the dissipation, they lose it um, um, at the boundary. The most important thing is the transfer term. If you remove the transfer term, the nonlinearity, maybe the first mode will explode. The modes will either explode uh, um, or they will um, decay. You have no sociology. So you need the nonlinearity in order to have this uh, um, um, sociology. And here this is just the remainder that the averaged global energy flows are the sum of the modal fl flows and they all should add up to, um, to zero. And so this is a, a, a recipe now. Um, so you have something like M snapshots. You have to write routines essentially for these three things for an inner product for a tree linear form from the convective term, uh, a B linear form which comes from the dissipative term, and maybe you want to consider the pressure power um, as well, then you need the surface integral. Compute the mean flow, compute the correlation matrix, determine the spectral analysis, compute the POD modes, compute the uh, um, Fourier coefficients. You see these operations are very simple, and if I show you my Fortran code, it's uh, uh, only uh, something like, like, like three pages long. So as an, as an augmentation, uh, uh, um, you can look at the dynamics. So this is your dynamical system after the Gaiokin projection. Uh, you can perform a modal analysis for each of the modes. And the modal analysis will tell you, for instance, uh, what is anything is missing in your, um, in, in your approach. For instance, you can see from, the, from Fi, if you should include the pressure term, you can see from the difference to zero if you should uh, add some stabilizing terms and so on. 
Any questions uh, um, um, so far? Oh. <laughs> yeah, you, yeah, you have to choose. So, so again, hands up. I will try to f start from you. <laughs> questions? No. <laughs> So, I've shown you now a procedure which I think most of you can program easily yourself, say, in, in, on, on one uh, a weekend. Uh, there, does, it, does it typically work or not? Well, there are a couple of things which you should keep in mind. There are some things which, make your, uh, which, which you may have to add to um, stabilize your Gaiorkin system. The first thing is maybe you are missing some modes in the POD which uh, are, have are stabilizing. So in my first lecture, I've shown the shift mode. If you don't add the shift mode uh, to the POD Gaiorkian model, it will be inherently uh, a fragile and, and potentially um, in robust. So the shift mode is one possibility. Essentially, you're, 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 this is a difference from the steady solution to the mean flow. Now, there's another um, aspect which uh, Steve has uh, mentioned. You can derive from the Navier-Stokes equation, from, from most boundary condition, that the quadratic term should be uh, energy conserving. And that said, it's energy conserving if the contribution at every instant to the whole fluctuation energy is zero. And you can show that this coincides with uh, uh, another condition. So you can de decompose the QIJK, so the three tensor, into in, in one quantity, which is the average, and another quantity, which is uh, um, the remainder. So you, you need to remove this part, because you will always have some numerical error, uh, to be Navier-Stokes consistent. This is the remaining uh, um, um, part. And this often stabilizes an otherwise unstable um, um, Gaiorkin system. Because the further you go uh, uh, with